like Jack Kirby said, kid, comic books will break your heart. Like many entertainment industries, the comic book industry does one thing very well, screwing over its talent. It's so common that you could almost say that it's a sign that you finally made it. The latest victim is Bill Willingham, writer and creator of the Vertigo series Fables. The series ran from 2002 to 2015, had great success, and won many awards back when those still mattered. However, over the years, things soured between Willingham and DC Comics, the owner of Vertigo, leading Willingham to take the substack to declare Fables is now in the public domain. Quote, As of now, 15 September 2023, the comic book property called Fables, including all related Fable spinoffs and characters, is now in the public domain. What was once wholly owned by Bill Willingham is now owned by everyone, for all time. It's done. And as most experts will tell you, once done, it cannot be undone. Takebacks are neither contemplated nor possible. That remains to be seen. I get what Willingham is doing. DC Comics won't play ball the way he wants, so he's open in the court to everyone. Lots of people jumped at this, saying that he owned DC Comics. But the problem is that without seeing his contracts, it's not clear what rights Willingham has to the concept of fables. And without that information, we don't know that he could simply hand over the story and characters to the public. Vertigo was part of DC Comics, but many of the comics published under that line were original creator-owned ideas. Fables fell into that category, implying that Willingham was the owner of the copyright to the series. However, things get murky when publication gets involved. It's not just ownership over the concept, it's control over it and all its manifestations. This is what happened to Superman's creators Siegel and Schuster. Detective Comics Inc. paid them $130 for Action Comics No. 1, with a contract stating that the pair effectively gave up all rights to the character, only for Superman to become a massive hit. When Siegel and Schuster tried to negotiate their rights back, DC refused, obviously. The pair sued the company, but while the judge in the initial case agreed that the pair hadn't signed over the copyright in the original contract, he did state that DC now owned the character. DC Comics paid the pair royalties, but had no intention of giving up Superman's copyright. The company even went one step further, effectively stealing Siegel's concept of Superboy, literally using parts of his script, while he served in World War II. He pitched them the idea before the war, but they rejected it. They then tried to claim ownership over Superboy, but a court ruled in Siegel's favor on that issue. That's one of the better-known screw jobs in comics, but it's not the only one. Jack Kirby went through similar issues over ownership and royalties over his creations at Marvel and DC Comics, with him getting shafted much like Siegel and Schuster. Part of the reason this happens is because of how the contracts were worded. In Siegel and Schuster's case, the contract stated, quote, In consideration to the $130 agreed to be paid me by you, I hereby sell and transfer such work and strip, all goodwill attached thereto, and exclusive right to the use of the characters and stories, continuity of the title and strip contained therein, to you and your assigns to have and hold forever, and to be your exclusive property. And I agree not to employ said characters by their names contained therein, or under any other names at any time hereafter, to any other person, firm, or corporation, or permit the use thereof by said other parties without obtaining your written consent therefore. The intent hereof is to give you exclusive right to use and acknowledge that you own said characters or story and the use thereof exclusively. That's a lot of legalese, but in English it basically says Detective Comics Inc. now owns the story and character of Superman. It says it a couple of times, but it's so wrapped up in hereofs and therefores that you might not notice, and that's the point. By the time you get to the part that clearly grants them ownership, you're not even sure you can speak English, let alone read it. It would appear that DC hasn't changed its contracts all that much in the last 90 years. Back in 2008, DC ran a webcomic company called Zuda that invited people to submit their work for a monthly competition. The prize would be getting the comic regularly published on Zuda's site. They offered an incredible page rate per panel, basically per page, $150, but the contract was jacked. I tried to find the whole thing, but DC has basically scrubbed anything related to Zuda, so I was only able to find sites that referenced the contract. Here's a portion about the rights you grant to Zuda should you win. It's a lot of legalese, so bear with me. Just trust that the sentences will end, and know that the purpose of all the verbiage is to confuse you. Quote, Section 2. Grant of Rights. 
in consideration of all promises made herein, and subject to the reversion rights set forth in paragraph 8 below, you grant and assign to Zuda, its successors, licensees, and assigns, solely and exclusively, in any and all languages and media, whether known or hereafter devised, throughout the universe, for the term of copyright, all rights in and to the material, collectively the rights. As used herein, material means the submission and the literary work written and or drawn, and or to be written and or drawn, by you as well as other adaptations or versions thereof now existing or hereafter created, whether created by you, Zuda, or third parties, including the title of the work, the art and script comprising the work, and the concepts, plots, themes, storylines, characters, including names and images, environmental settings, devices, characterizations, logos, trademarks, and designs, and other elements to the extent included in the work. In plain English, your soul is mine. You hand them everything that could possibly be covered under the copyright. You get some percentage of the net profit from the licensing, 1% if I remember correctly, except for music, which was 0.5%. But you have no say at all in what gets created, who creates it, or how it gets created. In fact, you essentially allow Zuda to control the story itself. That's when they talk about the other adaptations, whether created by you, Zuda, or third parties. They can make a reboot, retcon, or spinoff without your permission and without having to compensate you. Effectively, the only right you have to your work is that you retain the copyright, which just means they have to credit you somewhere. By the way, the rest of the contract was more jacked. If the webcomic were published in print, you weren't giving any royalties for second printings or new printings. This included if the initial printing was hardcover. You got no royalties for the paperback edition that would come out the next year. But my personal favorite was that the contract barred you, the creator of the work, from selling the book, poster, t-shirts, or independent sketches or drawings. So, if you went to a comic con, you were contractually barred from selling your own books, the original artwork, or even drawing commissions for your own characters. Incidentally, do you know who was one of the editors for Zuda Comics? Our favorite fake holiday, Juanza Sajefo, or as he was known then, Felicio Johnson. Anyway. This might be what Willingham's contract looks like. I doubt it, but it is possible. If he has a different contract, it still creates a problem unless it's clear who controls what. For example, who owns the artistic depiction of the characters? Willingham may own the descriptions of them as a writer, but who owns the way the different artists drew the characters? This may not seem important, but it is, because if Willingham doesn't own those depictions, then anyone trying to match them in their take could be sued by DC Comics for violating their copyright for the appearances. Now, all of this appeared to have happened because when the Guard changed to DC Comics, the new people apparently ignored whatever deals, concessions, or agreements Willingham had with the previous powers that be. According to him, whenever he brought this up, they just hand-waved them away. Quote, When I first signed my creator-owned publishing contract with DC Comics, the company was run by honest men and women of integrity, who, for the most part, interpreted the details of that agreement fairly and above the board. When problems inevitably came up, we worked it out, like reasonable men and women. Since then, over the span of 20 years or so, those people have left or been fired, to be replaced by a revolving door of strangers of no measurable integrity, who now choose to interpret every facet of our contract in ways that only benefit DC Comics and its owner companies. At one time, the Fable's properties were in good hands, and now, by virtue of attrition and employee replacement, the Fable properties have fallen into bad hands. It seems like Willingham got screwed over by the corporate changes at DC Comics and at the higher level due to all the acquisitions and changes at Warner Brothers Discovery. He talks about how he was treated for the 20th anniversary of Fables, quote, First they tried to strong arm the ownership of Fables from me. When Mark Doyle and Dan DiDio first approached me with the idea of bringing Fables back for his 20th anniversary, both gentlemen since fired from DC, during the contract negotiations for the new issues, their legal negotiators tried to make it a condition of the deal that the work be done as a work for hire, effectively throwing the property irrevocably into the hands of DC. When that didn't work, their excuse was, sorry, we didn't reach our contract going into these negotiations. We thought we owned it. Now, it's entirely possible that the negotiator had no idea what the original contract said, but you would think that Doyle and DiDio would know and mention it given Willingham's issues with DC over the years. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. That seemed like a weird oversight. I also wouldn't put it past corporate lawyers to ignore the parameters of a previous contract in the hope of getting a new one signed that better benefited their client. That said, without knowing what the original contract says, I don't know how a green could work on the anniversary project as a work for hire would hand the rights to Fables to DC Comics. Part of Willingham's issue also appears to be the money owed him and how DC regarded their control over the work. Quote, 
More recently, during talks to try to work out our differences, DC officers admitted that their interpretation of our publishing agreement and the following media rights agreement is that they could do whatever they wanted with the property. They could change the story or characters in any way they wanted. They had no obligation whatsoever to protect the integrity and value of the IP, either from themselves or from third parties, Telltale Games for instance, who wanted to radically alter the characters, settings, history, and premises of the story. I've seen this script they tried to hide from me for a couple of years. Nor did they owe me any money for licensing the Fable rights to third parties, since such a license wasn't anticipated in our original publishing agreement. He's dancing around it, but I think we know what Willingham is talking about. It's very likely that some people wanted to revamp Fables to make it more inclusive and diverse, and as a staunch conservative and someone very precious about his stories, Willingham would likely turn this down. So it appears DC tried to claim they didn't need his permission to do anything. Again, without seeing the contracts, we don't know if that's true. Most of the time when you sign away certain licensing rights, you don't control what happens. This is one of the reasons why George Lucas wanted to keep the licensing rights for Star Wars. He'd then control what was made and by whom. That didn't just apply to toys, bedsheets, and Halloween costumes. It also applied to comics, novels, TV shows, and films. He got the final say. If Willingham's contract gave him the final say to some degree, then DC would be in violation of the contract if they tried to make something without his consent or failed to pay him the money they owed him when new projects were created. Now, Willingham doesn't give us the complete specifics of his contracts, however, he does explain some of what's covered. Quote, I still can't publish Fables comics through anyone but DC Comics. I still can't authorize a Fable movie through anyone but them, nor can I license Fables toys nor lunchboxes nor anything else, and they still have to pay me for the books they publish. That sounds like he handed over licensing exclusively to DC Comics, and that might include the final say on what gets made. That's not an unusual deal, though. I suspect companies do this to avoid the Lucas situation where he walks away with total control and a significant chunk of change for the licensing. The deal is usually that the company gets to decide what gets made in exchange for royalties, which Willingham says was 50%, which is one hell of a deal. He goes on to say that anyone using his now public domain stories isn't part of those contracts, so they can do whatever they want, which would be true if Willingham has the ability to place fables in the public domain. The thing is, Fables is based on concepts and characters already in the public domain, and neither Willingham nor DC Comics can control whether someone decides to take folktale characters and place them in the modern world, so I don't see the appeal of using Fables to begin with. Just go and grab a copy of Grim Fairy Tales, pick some characters, and do whatever you want. This really seems designed to get back at DC Comics. Of course, DC responded to this move, stating, quote, the Fables comic books and graphic novels published by DC and the storylines, characters, and elements therein are owned by DC and protected under the copyright laws of the United States and throughout the world in accordance with applicable law and are not in the public domain. DC reserves all rights and will take such action as DC deems necessary or appropriate to protect its intellectual property rights. Obviously, they would say that, but again, all that hinges on what the contracts actually state. So, what does this mean for anyone who wants to use Fables? Until all this is cleared up, my suggestion, leave it alone. Like I just said, Fables is based on concepts and characters already in the public domain, so you don't need Willingham's stories to make up something similar. There is no copyright infringement if you do this. Speaking of which, Willingham comes up with an idea to address the mess that is the current copyright system. That's a whole video itself, but the simplified version is that right now, a copyright for a known creator lasts the creator's lifetime plus 70 years, and for anonymous, synonymous, or freelance work, the copyright lasts for 95 years from the year of its first publication, or 120 years from the year of its creation, whichever ends first. Willingham has a different idea. Quote, in my template for radical reform of those laws, I would like it if any IP is owned by its original creator for up to 20 years from the point of first publication, and then goes into the public domain for any and all to use. However, at any time before that 20-year span bleeds out, you, the IP owner, can sell it to another person or corporate entity, who can have exclusive use of it for up to a maximum of 10 years. Then it cannot be resold. It goes into the public domain. So then, at the most, any intellectual property can be kept for exclusive use for up to about 30 years, and no longer without exception. How about new? For a man complaining about getting screwed over by copyright law, it's weird that he proposed something that makes it easier to get screwed over by copyright law. This is a terrible idea. Stuff like this is exactly why I tell people they need to think more than one step ahead. The moment I read this, the first thing that popped into my head was Usagi Yojimbo. 
Stan Sakai has been making that book my entire life for four decades. He's still working on it, but under Willingham's proposal, Sakai's rights would have expired in 2004, putting Yusagi Yojimbo in the public domain. That would mean that a company could make a movie, a show, a game, or their own comic using Sakai's characters while he's still working on the book, and they wouldn't need his permission, they wouldn't have to pay him, they wouldn't even have to give him credit. Now apply this to something bigger, like Star Wars, or more recent, like Harry Potter, and you can see the problem. Some company could step in while something's at the height of its popularity and make bank on it without even having to think about the creators as long as it's been 20 years. But then it gets worse because they could take something that's been out of print or never hit it big and adapt that without crediting or paying the creators. What if somebody took Mike Waringo's Telos series and adapted that? It's been 20 years. They wouldn't have to pay Waringo's family or Todd DeZago or even credit them. That's thoroughly fucked up. Why would you do that to your fellow creators? The idea is to stop corporations from getting total control over these properties, not screw over the creators themselves. Lowering the time a company can retain a copyright would make more sense, but even that could backfire. Think about Jay and Barry giving the rights to Peter Pan to the Grand Ormond Street Hospital. He apparently did this because he intended for the money earned from the play and books to go to the children's hospital. Now, that was in the UK, which has different copyright laws, but my point is still the same. What if someone wants the copyright to go to a corporate entity or a certain person? Why should we be able to shorten that period, especially on newly created works under that corporation or that person? I see this backfiring against creators more than helping them. I mean, we just saw how easily Hollywood can make crazy money in just a decade by burning out a franchise with the MCU. But none of the people who created those ideas got any of that money, and most of the films were adapted from stories that were well over 20 years old. A 20-year copyright limit is just begging for a Disney or WB to come in, snatch up something that's been hot for two decades or something that fell off or never was, make a movie or a show, get the money, and ignore the people who created the concept. That's so shysty. So, no, I don't like Willingham's idea. I do agree, though, that we need to do something about how easily companies can take someone's creation without fairly compensating them. Some of these contracts are just diabolical. There's no way these companies don't know they're screwing people over, so there might need to be something put in place so no one can get Siegel and Schuster again. But I don't think the way is just putting everything into the public domain as soon as possible. I think it's making sure that the contracts are fair for all parties and actually enforced so that people aren't put in a situation where if the corporation decides to ignore what they agreed to, they can just get away with it because they have more money and better lawyers. But what do I know? I'm just some guy.